We're going to look now at topic number three. We've looked at topic one, which is a review of my story. And then we looked at topic two, which was a quiz, true and false quiz. Now at topic three, which is early theological formation in the Arabian background. Um, my Muslim friends are a bit concerned about how we approach this topic. They are not happy when I say that the Arabian experience influenced Muhammad and the formation of the Muslim Ummah. They're uncomfortable with that kind of language. Why are they uncomfortable with that? Because they believe that the Quran came from heaven, that every word in the Quran is a duplicate of an original book in heaven. And that this Quran, so let's say here's, here's the original book in heaven, and the Quran came down, they refer to this as Tanzil, it was sent down as a copy of that heavenly original. So my Muslim friends prefer that I use language like, this is the context in which the Quran came down. That kind of language, yes, that's right. This is the context. But to use language like that the context influenced, you know, they're uneasy with that. And so uh, I'm just sharing that with you. Um, I, uh, I, I will probably use um, a contextual language mostly in what I'm sharing today. Um, as I see it, the Quran reflects in many ways the context in which it happened. And, but again, if Badru Katarega, who wrote this dialogue, were standing here with me, he would say, Shank, I disagree with you on that. So I just want to openly share that, that as Christians, as we approach the Quran, and our Muslim friends as they approach it, there is oftentimes some difference here in our understanding of what was going on within that context. So let's look at the Arabian context. And first of all, the Christian context, in which the Quran took shape, and in which the Muslim Ummah, that means the Muslim community, the early Muslim Ummah, was formed. What is the context in which it was formed? And the first thing we note is the Christian context. The Quran developed in a thoroughly Christian, um, in, a very, in, in a context which was very much influenced by Christianity. For example, here is Arabia. Yemen in South Arabia was a Christian kingdom at this time. You know, this uh, bomber apparently was trained in South Yemen. That region, uh, the Christmas bomber, attempted bomber, you know, the, the, that airplane situation. Uh, he was, that region where he came from was at one time a Christian kingdom. And uh, it was Christianized by, by uh, apparently, by a Theophilus who was a missionary from India. Came and preached the gospel in South Yemen, and that became a Christian kingdom. In Arabia itself, there was a number of tribes that were Christian tribes at the time of Muhammad. Ethiopia was a Christian kingdom. It had been a Christian kingdom for some 300 years before Muhammad lived and taught in Arabia. And there was a lot of relationship between the Muslims and the Ethiopian Christians. In fact, um, at one point, uh, the Muslims, the, the, the very small Muslim community in Mecca was receiving so much harassment and persecution that 300 of them migrated to Ethiopia at the time of Muhammad to be protected by King Nagash, uh, the Christian king of Ethiopia. And he received them and protected them from harassment and persecution by the Meccans. So that there was a good relationship between Ethiopia and, and the Muslims of, of Saudi Arabia at the time of Muhammad. Um, and Sudan, present-day Sudan, was largely Christian at the time of Muhammad. And Egypt was largely Christian. In fact, Egypt had three translations of the Bible in three different Egyptian dialects. Um, 
And here's where the Alexander Catechetical School began, the first Christian university, which equipped people to be faithful to Christ in the world of Greek philosophy and pagan philosophy. And this catechetical school was a missionary training center and sent missionaries down into Sudan and all the way to Ethiopia and so forth. A very dynamic church. This is where Origen came from and Clement and so forth, you know. All of that was taking place in Egypt with the Bible translated into their languages. Ethiopia also had the Bible in their native Gies language, you see. So they had the Bible in, in their languages as well. And as we would know, of course, um, the uh, Palestinian regions were largely Christian with the scriptures in the Greek language for the Greek-speaking people, in Latin for the Latin-speaking people, in Syriac for the Syriac-speaking people. So this region of many different languages, they all had the scriptures in their languages and dynamic Christian communities. Um, and then we go on up here to present-day um, 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 Syria. Syria was also largely Christian, and uh, they had the Bible in their own language. You go on around here to present-day Iraq, Iraq was largely Christian. And in fact, within Iraq, there was a Christian kingdom called Edessa. And uh, these Edessans were not only Christian, but they were vigorously missionary, sending missionaries up into Europe and, uh, and uh, all the way uh, um, uh, east into deep into Asia, a dynamic missionary sending, sending uh, a center. This was the first Christian kingdom in the world where the king and his whole country became Christian in Edessa, right there in present-day Iraq. Um, and then you move on over to Iran. And Iran was, uh, there was Christian minorities in Iran, but the church in Iran had suffered a great deal um, because of, um, of uh, the Zoroastrian influence. Um, there was a lot of persecution and suffering in the church in Iran. But in spite of its suffering persecution, the Iranian church was also very involved in global missions. And um, uh, shortly after Muhammad uh, began to preach, actually, had sent missionaries all the way to China. So these are, these are churches which surrounded the Arabian center where Islam developed, you see, and very influential. So it's important to understand that Islam develops in a world in which Christianity was dynamically present and that the scriptures were in many of these languages the syrians the greeks the latins the egyptians and the ethiopians and the iranians all had the scriptures in their languages you see um, and um and uh, and that that's that's very very significant now also these churches were experiencing controversies uh, related to christology oftentimes you see, these are missionary churches. Polytheists are becoming Christians. How do you interpret the Trinity in a polytheistic world without becoming polytheists? How can you say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit um, when you are speaking to polytheists? For they just assume that apparently Christians are also polytheists. So we had that kind of a struggle developing. And one response of the church to that struggle of interpreting monotheistic Trinitarian theology in a polytheistic world, was the Aryan approach. The Aryans, the Aryan movement began in Egypt. There was a, uh, about the second century, uh, into the second century, there was a uh, Christian gathering of priests and bishops and so forth and deacons there in Alexandria. And Arius was a deacon. And in the middle of this meeting, he says, you know, there's a time when Christ was not. Uh, Christ became the Son of God by being obedient to God. And whoo, the roof blew off. And uh, this Aryan controversy just swept Egypt and the whole region like a brush fire. You know, I just, you're out there, the camel caravans are debating Aryan theology. <laughs> it was a very theological time. And the churches felt very deeply about this with enormous discussion and debate going on, you know. Um, and all of it had to do with how you interpret God as one in a polytheistic world. And Arian had a solution. He said, to say Jesus is the Son of God in eternity. No, that doesn't help us in the polytheistic world. He, he became the Son of God by being obedient, 
you know. It's, it's a form of, of, we could say, modern day modernism, you see, which also eats away at some dimensions of the church, particularly in the West. Now, the Council of Nicaea was convened uh, in 325 AD to deal with this controversy, the Council of Nicaea. And um, the Council of Nicaea decided that Arianism is a heresy and uh, that Christ is truly, truly the eternal Son of God. That's what the Council of Nicaea was about. And the Nicaean Creed has come out of that, which many of our churches confess. Um, it, some of our churches, some like the Orthodox and so forth, they have the Nicaean Creed very regularly uh, recited in their, in, their, in their worship services, you see. So the church decided that Arianism is not, um, is not true to biblical witness about Jesus. But still, and so Arianism began to die out, you see. It began to die out because it wasn't faithful to the biblical witness. And because the church as a whole had decided this is going aside from, from, the, from the foundations of biblical faith. Uh, but it was still around the edges. And um, as I see it, the Muslim movement uh, in many ways um, reflects that Arian approach to Jesus, you see. He is... He is a wonderful, wonderful prophet, but he certainly is not truly the eternal son of God. Now that's, that's Islam. And in that sense, I don't mean that Islam is Arianism, but uh, the Islamic Christology, the Islamic Christology and the Aryan Christology have, have a lot of similarities in, in, in them. Um, and um, of course, unlike Arianism, the Islamic movement uh, was not formed by the biblical scriptures, you see. The Aryan movement was critiqued on the basis of the biblical scriptures, but the Islamic movement as it developed uh, did not uh, experience that critique because the Quran became an alternative authority to the Bible, whereas for the church, the Bible always was the authority, and so with biblical authority, they were able to critique Arianism. But that critique is not within the Muslim movement for the Quran is the center of the authority to which they look as they look at their Christology. So that was one whole dimension, you know, this whole Aryan conflict. The other would be Nestorianism. And um, um, Nestorius was a, a very uh, effective bishop uh, the, of these Eastern churches. And um, he, um, he and his fellow travelers struggled with the question if uh, Jesus is truly God, how could he be crucified? I mean, how can you kill God? That's, that's, that's a theological challenge. And the, for an Astorius, the answer was uh, that the human Jesus died, but the divine Jesus escaped the cross. You see, they viewed Jesus as having <coughs> dual natures, two different natures, the divine and the human. It's the human that dies. The divine is rescued from the cross. The, the Nestorian solution to that, to that theological challenge that, that we live with as Christians. Now, uh, Muhammad, he traveled extensively, you know, and uh, gets up to Syria occasionally. And uh, many people think that he probably uh, this gets up to Syria occasionally where Nestorian theology was very, very prevalent. And many people think that probably he spent uh, in his travels and in his business work, business uh, affairs with, with his uh, wife, um, Khadija, that uh, he may have well spent uh, overnights in, in Syrian monasteries and, um, and, and was in touch with Nestorian theology. It could well be. In any event, the Islamic denial of the crucifixion of Jesus is not a strange theology because on the edges of the Christian movement there was also these perceptions that Jesus, the divine Jesus, was truly not crucified. You get what I mean? That this, this, the problem of the cross in relationship to the Messiah that Islam seeks to resolve by saying, well, he was never crucified, he's taken to heaven bodily. Uh, probably, um, Muhammad would have felt that the Christians would agree with him 
you see. Because of his exposure, I would think, on his journeys to Syria to Nestorian theology. It wasn't all that different than Nestorian theology. And even uh, his Christology denying that Jesus is truly the Son of God, he well may have felt that this was not far from what Christians were thinking in some of his, ex some of his exposure to Arian thinking, which although it was waning, it was on the way out, it was still somewhat present within the churches um, at the time of Muhammad. So th those theological issues, it's clear as you read the Quran that there is a, um, an interaction. It, it, it's clear to me, it seems to me, that there's an interaction between the Quran and some of these theologies which were present within the church. Um, another dimension of the Christian context was the Constantinian approach. Now, the Constantinian approach um, develops in um, 310, 312, sorry, 312 AD, um, Constantine is uh, heading towards Rome. Um, he had been up at uh, England as a Roman general, and now he's moving south to Rome because he wants to become the emperor. And so there's going to be a big war between Constantine and Maxentius. Maxentius, who was the, uh, who was the general in charge of Rome itself, and Constantine wants to become the emperor. So they're going to have war together. And, and uh, Constantine claims that the night before the battle, he saw on, um, in the heavens the um, cross. It was the high row cross. High row, you know what this refers to? The, the Greek letter hi, which is the first letter in Christus, and the row, the second letter in Christus. These are the Greek letters. You put them together. You had the first two letters of Christus, and also the cross, with Jesus on the cross and his head hanging over. See, That's the sign he claims he saw in the sky, which is used in many Orthodox and Catholic churches, even in other churches as well today, that high row sign, which is a sign of Christ on the cross, you see. That's the sign he claimed that he saw in the heavens with the command, under this sign, conquer. And so he went into, so he, he painted this sign on the shields of his soldiers, went into battle, and he won the war, you see. And that is the beginning of a, of a colossal transformation in the story of the Western church, where the church now and the empire becomes one. And we'll talk more about that later on in this seminar. But the, but the implications were just simply phenomenal, which means, in essence, that the church and empire are walking together. So when Constantine would go to war, the bishops would march with him, you see, because the empire is Christian. Constantine is now favorable to the church. So the bishops of the church want to support this Christian emperor, you see. So the bishops would walk with him, march with him in war, and pray for his success in the battles and so forth. And so that merger of church and the political order is Constantinian. And both the Western Church and the Eastern Church, all of them, by and large, walked in that way. You have exceptions like the church in South India and the Persian Church. That never happened in the Persian Church. It was always a minority movement, never had political power, always persecuted. But, um, but uh, the Western Church, like in Egypt and so forth, that merger of church and the political order was very, very real, you see. So when we talk about Islam uniting the political order and the religious order, let's beware that the context in which that kind of theology developed was Constantinian. As Muhammad looked at the Syrian church or at the Palestinian church or the Egyptian church, you know, or even the Ethiopian church, he saw churches in which the political order and the religious order are united together. And so within the Islamic Dar al-Islam, the region under Islamic political control, that is the way they function. And this is like an Islamic alternative to the Christian merger of church and empire. Now, Muhammad travels to Syria in his uh, work as a merchant before he began preaching and 
proclaiming the Quran. And here he sees this Syrian civilization advanced, developing, and they have a book from God. He looks to the south, west, and there is Ethiopia across the Red Sea. And here Ethiopia is a dynamic, developing Christian kingdom. And they have a book from God, the Gies Bible, you see. And then he looks at Egypt, a dynamic, developing, uh, rambunctious civilization. And they have the book of God, in fact, in three of their dialects. And he looks to the Greeks, and they have the book from God. The series, they, you know, everywhere he looks, these Christian communities, which are nurturing, dynamic, developing civilizations, all have scripture. And then he looks to the Arabians, and they have no scripture, you see. So why are the Arabians so backwards? You know, why are they so backwards? Why are they a bunch of nomadic warring tribes, many of whom can't even read and write? Well, apparently it's because they don't have a book from God. And so within Arabia, there was an enormous spiritual vacuum. There were some tiny excerpts of the Bible that had been translated into Arabic by some of these tribal groups, but very little. They didn't have the Bible in its wholeness by any means in the Arabic language. And so the only awareness that Muhammad or the Arabians could have of the Christian faith was what they heard orally. They did not have access to the Bible in the Arabic language. And so why are we so backwards? We don't have a book of God in our language. We don't have it, you see. So this enormous yearning. And the Quran in the Arabic language becomes a fulfillment of that spiritual vacuum. I wish so much that the churches had taken the Arab people seriously and translated the Bible into the Arabic language. I don't know. But had Muhammad been able to read the Bible in his own Arabic language, I would not be surprised but that he would become a Christian preacher, you know? You know, a prophet preaching from the Bible instead of from the Quran. But he didn't have the Bible in the Arabic language. And so the Quran fills that spiritual vacuum and he becomes the prophet who proclaims the Quranic revelation, uh, which has a high respect for the Bible, but it is quite different than biblical revelation. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the, so as, as you read the Quran, you see these streams um, uh, which um, are being uh, even debated, you see. Um, the, the, the Quran is very aware of the presence of Christians and the Christian faith and uh, the challenges of Christian Christology and so forth. And the Quran, it's clear, uh, views itself it, it, the, the, the Quranic message is attempting to bring clarity to the Christians. The Christians are divided about Christology. And so the Quran comes, as the Muslims saw it, as a clarification now to help Christians get things clear, you see. That's, that's its message. So there's a lively interaction between the emerging Muslim movement and the Christian movement, which are reflected in many different ways within the Quran, as I see it. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. Comments, questions? I assume Muhammad was able to read in some other languages the Bible or Torah, right? Well, he is unlettered. He is unlettered. That does not mean that he was illiterate necessarily. He could, he hardly, he could, he could hardly be illiterate when he was a merchant, because merchants had to do figures and so forth. But it means he was uneducated. He probably had a basic literacy. But uh, no, I would not think that Muhammad had sufficient education to read Syriac, for example. He didn't read the, read the Bible. He didn't read the Torah, or he just heard it verbally. He just heard it. He heard it verbally. Yeah, yeah. he heard it verbally. Yeah. I don't, think he, I don't think the Arabian, it was, not, uh, it was not accessible in Arabic, 
and the few Arabians who might have been able to read Syriac and so forth, Muhammad was not one of them. Was Muhammad ever a Christian, maybe when he was young, maybe he was attending a Christian gathering somewhere? A Christian gathering? Not when he was young, but uh, when he went to, we don't know, but when he went to Syria occasionally in these merchant cam camel caravans that he would direct on behalf of Khadija, um, it is, uh, it is very easy to imagine uh, that he would have had a lot of time with Christians when he was in Syria. In fact, a friend of mine who lived in Syria for some years said, I think Muhammad, in fact, spent overnights in Syrian Orthodox Church uh, motels, you see. For example, the, the, the prayer forms in Islam are very similar to Syrian Orthodox prayer forms. You see, very similar. How did he get that? Well, my friend says, I can just imagine him uh, picking up these prayer forms as he uh, interacted with the Christians in Syria. Mm -hmm. Muslims don't like us to suggest that the background, the culture influenced Muhammad because it will sound like uh, when we hear uh, liberal theologians talking about the Bible, they also believe that uh, culture influenced the writers of the New Testament. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And it's this ton zeal that, that the Quran was sent down and, and is suspended above history. It's suspended above the context. That's the Islamic understanding, which is contrary. It, uh, not contrary. It is different than the Christian understanding where the word becomes human and lives within culture, you see. This word supersedes culture. It, it, it hangs above. However, having said that, the Muslim movement also has a deep sense that it is in continuity with the Christian movement, you see. That it is the kind of fulfillment of the Christian movement. Not adverse to the Christian movement, but a fulfillment and is intended to bring clarification to the Christian movement. Um, so, to say that um, Muslims pray like the Syriac Orthodox pray, and that it may be that our form, their forms of prayer were influenced by the Syrians, It'd be interesting to hear what Katarega would say about that. But I think he'd probably say, yeah, that's true. The forms of prayer are not dictated in the Quran. <laughs> you know, they developed. Where did that development come from? And to say it may have been Syrian influence that helped to form the way they prayed, uh, probably Katarega would say, yeah, you may have a point. That may, we, may be true. Because the Muslim movement is in continuity with the Christian movement as they would see it. Yes, yes. What's in Quran? Do they divide Torah and New Testament, Judaism and Christianity? How did, how did Quran and Muhammad, did they address this question? There's two different scriptures or like all the New Testament and Christians and Judaizers? Well, the, the Quran specifically mentions the Torah as being divine revelation, the Zabur, which means the Psalms, as being divine revelation, and the Injil, which means the gospel, as being divine revelation. Um, but then it also has high respect for the entire Bible. But within the Bible, there are these three scriptures that are specifically mentioned. And of course, Jews are recognized as being the people of the Torah, certainly, within the Quran. There is more about Moses in the Quran than any other prophet, you see. So very high respect for, for, for the Jewish people. Of course, a sharp critique of the Jews when they refused to accept that he was a prophet of God. Yeah, that's where the great divide happened then. Mm -hmm. What if we will say, okay, uh, uh, Quran says this, this and that. And they say that uh, further writings of our scholars and prophets also say this, this and that. They explain. How do they treat Quran compared to other writings in their um, faith? How no, do they compare? Yeah, uh, what, the, the Quran, of course, is incomparable. It is um, uh, inimitable, meaning it is not replicatable. It is utterly distinct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Quran does not in any way stand on par with other literature or scripture. It is, it is, it is a miracle. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efca.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.